life in a war zone is not easy, I guess. Most of us have no idea what a war is. Some of you served in the military, you have some closer ideas. But most of us only have some dictionary definitions, but those are only definitions. Or some of us have seen war movies, but those are only movies. War or living in a war zone must be something extremely difficult. I remember some stories told by my grandma. She experienced World War II. The village was under occupation, and you could see foreign soldiers all over the place. The main problem was they were eating up all the food of the village. My grandma would tell us that the soldiers would run after chickens. They would catch the chicken, grab the head, just spin it like this, and hurl it straight into the wood fire oven. Or they would ride their horses next to the flock, and with the bayonet of their rifle just hit the lamb, or send an arrow to the lamb, and then they would force you to roast it for them. War zone. The most problematic thing was for somebody to be a woman in a war zone because they would sometimes abuse women, especially girls, young girls. They would even rape them. So my grandma, together with some other girls from the village, had to leave the village, and for months they lived out in an orchard, in a shelter, in a hut, half in the ground or under the ground, half above. I don't know how to call that kind of a, a shelter. But that's where they spent their life for months, while the war was still raging. While there in the shelter, they had one question, one important question on their hearts. You know what that question was? When is this gonna be over? We are going to leave them for now there, in their shelter, and uh, we are going to go to the book of Daniel chapter 8, back to the war zone of chapter 7. The structure of chapter 8 is very simple. You have a vision first, a vision seen by Daniel, then right in the middle you have an audition. So that's a vision that doesn't have picture, it's just the sound. And then, in the final part of the chapter, we have a partial interpretation given by Gabriel, a messenger. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your Spirit will open our hearts and minds. Jesus Christ will be lifted up, and we will grasp the meaning of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Daniel the prophet sees a vision, a vision that is very much similar and yet different from what he saw in chapter 7. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, starts with the words, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, this is still a Babylonian king, a vision appeared to me, to me Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time, that is the one in chapter 7. 
Do you still remember what was the reaction of Daniel after he saw the vision in chapter 7? Daniel chapter 7 verse 28. This is what the reaction was. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. And my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. If this is a vision similar and yet different to what we saw in chapter 7, I wonder what Daniel's reaction will be this time. And in Daniel chapter 8, starting with verse 15, we can see his reaction. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning... Suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, verse 16, and I heard a man's voice who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision, verse 17. So he, that is Gabriel, came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. The vision refers to the time of the end. Please keep in mind the time of the end. That's the first time this concept appears here in the chapter, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Very important to keep in mind, verse 18 goes on saying, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. Verse 19. And he said, look, I am making you to know what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, and time, appointed time here in the Hebrew is moed. Moed is a word that has to do with the sanctuary service, with the Jewish festivals. The end shall be at the appointed time. Or as the NAS has it, it pertains to the appointed or moed of the end. So there is a moed of the end. There is an appointed time of the end. A word that has to do with the Jewish festivals. And yes, here you have the second time when this idea that the vision Daniel sees refers to it to the end appears. The second time. So then Gabriel comes and explains the vision, at least partially. And then this is what Daniel says in verse 26. Therefore, Seal up the vision. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel still. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Many days in the future. The NIV says, for it concerns the distant future. Or the ESV says, for it refers to many days from now. This is the third time when it is pointed out that the vision that Daniel sees in chapter 8 does not have to do with a very short or limited time in his day and age. It has to do with what? The end, the far future, to many days from now it refers. Interesting. So let's see then what he saw. Starting with verse 3, a ram, so first he saw a ram, a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up, up last, he did according to his will, and, and what? Became great. It became great. I will illustrate this concept of becoming great. With this, this will become great. Can you see it coming? It's growing. It's becoming great. I cannot make it greater for a reason. I will show it in a moment. 
Okay, so here you have the ram becoming great. And Gabriel explains what the ram is about. Verse 20 says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Have we seen Media and Persia before? Of course, where? Twice, where? Chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, and then Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 2, you had a silver breast and arms, right? The two branches of the Middle Persian Empire, Medes and Persians. In Daniel chapter 7, we saw what? A bear representing the same kingdom. Here we have a ram. Very interestingly, the vision here does not start, start with Babylon. There is a reason why. Because the time period that is pointed out in this vision in chapter 8 does not start in the time of the Babylonians. It starts in the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. But let's move on. There's another animal coming up. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. What does that mean? It was flying, right? <laughs> and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, verse 7, and I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him. He attacked the goat rammed the ram. Attacked, rammed the ram, and broke its two horns. Verse 8. Therefore the male goat grew very great. Okay, so now you understand why I couldn't make that one very great. Because this one, is very, that was great. It became great. This one has to become very great. Is it very great? Greater, right? Okay. I cannot make it exceedingly great because there's something coming. Okay. So this is great. This one is very great. Hmm. Keep that in mind. Great, then very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Oh, so who's this? Gabriel will explain. Verse 21 and 22. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Who was the first king of Greece? Alexander the Great. That's correct. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power, meaning they will not have the same power as the great horn. Hmm, interesting. Have we seen Greece before? Of course we have. Where? Well, in chapter 2, it was the bronze belly and tides, right? In chapter 7, it was the leopard that has had wings, four wings and four heads. So now you understand why this goat was not touching the ground, right? It was very quick. And here we have a he-goat. Interesting. But then the story goes on. And out of one of them, one of the winds, because that's the final thought in the previous verse, came a little horn, which, 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 say it for me please, grew, now you understand why I made that great, this one very great, because this one 
has to become how? Exceedingly great. Exceedingly great. Okay, I'm going to stop here with it. But are you, are you noticing what is happening here? Great, very great, and then exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now, most Bible interpreters or commentators will say that this description here of somebody that moves toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, the glorious land of Israel, is Antiochus Epiphanes. Why? Because this Seleucid king, or the Hellenistic king called Antiochus Epiphanes, he went to Jerusalem, he sacrificed a pig on the altar of Jerusalem, desacralized thereby the temple, and they would say, this is the power here, and practically this vision deals with Antiochus Epiphanes. I have a problem. No, pr what the problem is? The problem is that this power is exceedingly great. This one was great, the Medo-Persian power. This one became very great, right? Can you see the progression? Great, very great, and this one is exceedingly great. So that means Antiochus Epiphanes should be greater even than Alexander the Greek, Ale Alexander the Great. But historically, that's not true. Antiochus Epiphanes was strong, but about this big. He wasn't bigger than Alexander the Great. He wasn't even mentioned in most history books. So, is it this one, Antiochus Epiphanes, or this one, somebody much bigger? Which one do you think it is? Well, it has to be the bigger one. You know why? Remember, we emphasized three times the text says that the vision has to do with the end, if the end is here. And this power here is Antiochus Epiphanes. This power will stop here. This will not go on. This will, this will be practically destroyed and taken out of the scenes of history. But there is something interesting here. There is something interesting and that is that if you want to see Antiochus Epiphanes in this picture, you only can see him as a type of something much bigger. And the Bible does typology quite often. So Antiochus Epiphanes can be a type of a much greater, exceedingly great power that comes down the road in history. But wait for a moment. Haven't we seen the little horn before? We have. Where? In chapter 7. Yes, in chapter 7, there is a little horn. Where is the little horn in chapter 7? It's right in the Roman section. Did we see it in chapter 2? No, in chapter 2 we have the iron legs and the iron plus clay toes. 
So the horn is not there. But have we seen the horn in chapter 7? Absolutely. Now look at chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, the description of the little horn. 24, 25 in chapter 7. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another, the little horn, shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against or at the side of the Most High, shall persecute or wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and the law. Then, or end, the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half of a time. Here we are. For a time, times, and half of a time. So we have that little horn here. And the question is then, is the little horn in chapter 8 the same as the little horn in chapter 7? Of course it is. It's the same description practically. But there is a very interesting principle when it comes to Bible prophecy. It's called rep repetition and expansion or reiteration and elaboration. The little horn in chapter 7 appears as the final segment of the Roman Empire. It's a power that comes in the wake of Rome. In chapter 8, however, the little horn is used like a synecdoche. Is anybody here that knows what a synecdoche is? A synecdoche is a literary device, a figure of speech. What it means is when you use a part for the whole. A part for the whole. For instance, when the captain shouts and says, all hands on deck, what does that mean? Everybody has to put their hands on the deck? No. It means that all the crew, right? So hands stay for, for the crew. All the crew has to be on deck. Right? Or... If I'm telling you I'm planning to take my wheels out for a spin, am I going to take my wheels out? What is the wheels for? That's the car, right? When you pray and say, give us today our daily bread, are you praying for bread? Or the bread stands there for what? for food. You understand how it works? You have the part that represents the whole. Right here, the little horn as a part of the Roman Empire represents the entire Roman Empire. And indeed, there is a very interesting similarity between Antiochus Epiphanes and Rome because who invaded the glorious land of Israel and destroyed the temple altogether? That was Rome in its political phase in AD 70, right? So you can see the correlation between those two powers. But obviously this power here, the little horn, does the same thing that the little horn in chapter 7 does. What does it do? Verse 10. And it grew up to the host of heaven. Who's the host of heaven? You may think it's angels. We'll see. And it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. The best way to interpret this is to listen to Gabriel. Because he is the God-given authority to interpret this. So this is what Gabriel says in verse 24. His power shall be mighty, 
but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty. Is that for the stars? And stars may represent leaders. Not sure. But it says, and also the holy people. In chapter 7, the little horn messes with the saints of the Most High. Here, the, it destroys the holy people. The hosts of heaven, according to Gabriel's interpretation, is who? The holy people. God's saints. Those that live on the earth, but as the Apostle Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, I think, he says that we are citizens of heaven. So here we have a power that goes against the saints again. Nevertheless, the main target of this power is not the saints. Look what it says in verse 11. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host? That's obviously Jesus. And by him, the daily, the daily tamid, a sacrifice was added by translators. The Hebrew only has the word tamid. And tamid in the Hebrew Bible means the continual, the daily service of the sanctuary. Everything that involved, that were involved, was involved in the daily service of the sanctuary. So it goes, exalts himself against the prince of the host, and by him the daily, that line should be moved a little bit to cut sacrifice, not the daily. So by him the daily were taken away, was taken away, and the place or the foundation of his sanctuary, and the sanctuary here is Mikdash, was cast down. So this power is not like the other powers. In chapter 7, it was indicated that this horn was different from the others. Because most of the time, horns or powers, authorities on this earth, expand this way. Left, right, front and back. This doesn't do that. This goes upward to Jesus Christ himself, to the sanctuary. Why? Because Jesus is in the sanctuary. And the word sar here in the Hebrew language is also used for priests, prince and priests. Verse 12, because of transgression, an army, and the word is Tzava, an army was given over to the horn. Tzava means army, but it can also mean service. Some suggest that this horn received a service or a tamid that is in opposition to the tamid done by Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So this horn receives an army or a service to oppose the daily, the daily of the prince of the host, and he cast truth down to the ground and did all this and prospered. To make sure we have the right interpretation here, let's read what Gabriel told Daniel about this section of the dream. Verse 25, through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? It makes it more and more vivid that we are talking about somebody going against Jesus himself, Sar Sarim, prince of princes, or if Sar is priest, then Sar Sarim is high priest, but he shall be broken without human means or without human hands. Wow. So this horn will be broken without human means, without human hands. 
Do you remember something similar happening in chapter 2 and chapter 7? Absolutely. In chapter 2, the stone that appears without the touch of a human hand destroys the statue. In chapter 7, there's a heavenly court that does justice and takes dominion and kingdom away from uh, the little horn and gives it to the saints. So, who's taking the power away from the little horn in chapter 8? Who breaks the horn? How is this horn broken? Well, now comes the centerpiece, is the audition section right in the middle of the book, verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, what did one holy say to the other holy? What? How long? Admatai, that's the Hebrew. Actually, it should be translated with, until when? Until when will the vision, will, will the vision be? Concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Admatai, how long? This question is echoed later in the book of Revelation chapter 6. Book of Revelation chapter 6 verse 10 says, And they, the souls under the altar. Yeah, there is a picture there with some souls under the altar crying out for justice. It's the same picture that you can see in Genesis chapter 4 when Abel's blood is crying up to God from the ground. Can the blood cry? Of course not. But it's a, it's a way of saying it that, hey, God knows what is going on here. The blood is asking God to intervene. The blood is asking for justice to be done. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there's an answer given here, verse 11 in Revelation 6. It was said to them that they should rest a while, a, a little while longer, until, until both the numbers of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. These two passages are parallel. And the one in Revelation deals with the people, with the saints, with the holy ones, with the holy people. The, the answer in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, however, focuses on the sanctuary. And he said, so one saint asked the other one, how long? Or Admatai. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, or the, the Hebrew says, evening mornings. Then the sanctuary, the Kodesh, that's the word here. It's important because previously we saw another word, the Mikdash. Mikdash was used for the entire sanctuary. Kodesh is only used for the Holy of Holies. So the Kodesh shall be cleansed when after 2300 evening mornings and this word cleansed in the hebrew is nitzdak which means justified purified vindicated rededicated made legitimate made right restored to its rightful state and the septuagint that's the lxx the first Greek translation of the Bible used the Greek word kataristesetai, which clearly indicates that the same kind of service was to be done here in the sanctuary that was done by the high priest on Yom Kippur in the earthly sanctuary, Yom Kippur being the day of atonement. The Day of Atonement. Huh, that's an interesting festival. So is that the Moed that was indicated in the introduction of uh, Gabriel? Absolutely. 
How do I know that this is Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement here? The two animals that are presented in this vision, the ram and the goat, did you know those are the two animals that were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement? It's like the whole context creates or sets the stage so that you and I can understand what is going on here. What is going on here? Where is the same picture that you can see in chapter 7 when the heavenly court does justice. In chapter 7, it's a heavenly court with God the Father right in the middle and they do justice. And as a result of them doing justice, the dominion and the kingdom of the little horn is taken and given to the saints. Here, the same picture, but in the holy of holies, in the heavenly sanctuary. How do I know it's a justice picture? Very simple. In Jewish mind, in the Jewish mentality, what happened on Yom Kippur or on the Day of Atonement, was God doing justice. The sins of the people that were stored, so to speak, in the Holy of Holies were taken, put on the head of the goat of Azazel. The goat had to take them into the wilderness and had to die there. Thus, justice was served. Not only that. To this day, do you know how Jews greet one another on the day of Yom Kippur? Gmar Hatima Tova. Hatima Tova. Meaning, have a good final sealing. Because on an individual level, they knew when God does justice, taking their sins, those that were brought into the sanctuary, to the Holy of Holies, to the Tamid, to the daily service, when God does that justice, that means that the individual life of every ch child of God is sealed. If your sins were handled by the high priest, then you were good to go, you were free, you can start a new episode of your life free of sin. If not, you would die as a result of divine justice. Oh, so here we actually have a sanctuary picture that is from the above history realm of the book of Daniel. How do I know this is above history? Because I suspect the 2,300 evening mornings this long period of time would be much longer than the time that leads up to AD 70 when the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem was destroyed. I suspect this is a longer time. But you may say, well, at this time we don't know. Because we don't know what it means to 1,300 evening mornings. If those are days, do we have six years and some? here? Or should we take those as years? Even if you answer that question and you clarify it, we still have one very important piece missing. When does it start? Because depending on where it starts, you know where it will lead. So at this point, we don't know. What we know is it seems to be a long period of time. But we don't have all the data. Is there anything in the passage, though, that indicates that here we have to deal with an above history scene? So this is not the sanctuary in Jerusalem? Absolutely. And it's exactly the parallel the parallel that you saw on screen just a moment ago, the parallel between the heavenly court and the Nitzdak Kodesh, or the cleansing of the sanctuary. The heavenly court, where does it happen? 
it happens somewhere in the heavenly realm. So if these two prophecies are parallel, then this cleansing of the sanctuary has to be the same scene. And yes, according to Jewish tradition, the Holy of Holies was the throne room and the judge room of God himself. So that's where God does justice, and from there, his divine justice goes toward the whole world. Watch this. And I want to take you back to that shelter. You know, we left my grandma in the shelter. Remember? They had one question in mind. What was the question? Admatai. How long? Until when? When is this going to be over? Yeah. While they were there in the shelter, periodically, somebody from the family, like an elderly person, somebody that they would not catch and use for the army, somebody that knew the forest and knew how to avoid trouble, would go and take food to them or clothes, whatever items, necessary items they needed. And just imagine how that elderly guy goes to the shelter there and they have those conversations. Very silent, because you never know. Everything can have ears. So you're there listening to what they speak about. The girls have questions about what? About everything, home. How is she doing? How is him doing? How is the other doing? What's happening in the village? All those questions. The main question, however, is what? When is this going to be over? If you were the elderly guy, what would you say? We don't know. Nobody knows. One day is going to be over. But let's change the scenario a little bit. On his way to the shelter, this elderly guy that brings food and clothes and other necessary items sees two army officers sitting under a tree. And he says, wow, that's interesting. And they seem to be speaking, even arguing. And he says, I want to know what they are speaking about. He goes closer to them, just creeps silently closer. And when he listens carefully, he can hear one of them tell the other one, this will take 2,300 evening mornings. And then it's going to be done. Justice is going to be served. And that's all he can hear. He has to go on. He has to go to bring the food, the clothes, and the necessary items. So now you are there. And they have their conversation. The girls ask all those questions. But the main question is this. What is the main question? When is this going to be over? What would be your answer if you were the old guy? What? You know, just heard them, 2,000 300 evening mornings. But what is that? You understand the dilemma? What is that? Is that six plus years? Is that 2,300 years? And even if you can answer that question, there's one more difficult question. What's the, the most difficult question here? When does it start? You understand the dilemma of Daniel here? He's got the answer, and does he know now? Mm -mm. It goes on in verse 26, Gabriel speaks, 
still, and he says, and the vision, and the word there is marech, marech refers to the centerpiece, which is the audition part, the part in verses 13 and 14, specifically about the 2,300 evening mornings. The marech of the evenings and mornings, which was told, he says, is true. Oh, it's true, okay, it's true. Therefore, seal up the vision. Oh, so, so I can't understand it. Seal up the vision, and the vision here is kazon, meaning the whole vision. Seal it up, for it refers to many days in the future. See, we read this at the beginning. It refers to many days in the future. It concerns the distant future, for it refers to, the, to many days from now. So, Obviously, Daniel should have known at this point that what was revealed to him, if he has to seal it, he could not fully comprehend. And it was not something that concerned him that had to do with his own life, the immediate future of his life. So then Daniel says, verse 28, And I, Daniel fainted. Whew, what happened? He fainted and was sick for days. Do you understand how, how strong this was on Daniel? He fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished. I was astonished because the vision, the marech, which has to do with the 2,300 evening mornings. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Do you now understand it? I wish. But we'll have to wait until chapter 9. What we know for now is, though, there was a big question asked. Admatai, how long? And the answer was, one day it's going to be over. When? After 2,300 evening mornings. At the end here, it's going to be over. Yeah, but we don't know where it starts. This will happen in chapter 9. Up to that point, please keep in mind, God gives divine revelation. And the way he does it, so that only those that really are interested will grasp it, will understand it, is he gives parallel descriptions. Repeat and expand. Reiterate and elaborate. Looking at all those things, we know God is in control. And no matter what, history is in his hands. And sure enough, we will know when this time starts and when it ends. And from that point on in history, we have the deliberation, the deliberation section of divine justice, because that's how divine justice works. First, it's being deliberated, like in a courtroom, in front of the whole universe, the courtroom, the judges sit down, they deliberate, and then there's an execution part of divine justice. Meaning that in the end, divine justice is going to be served. And justice is being reestablished in the whole universe. Because God is love, but he's also just.